Okay. 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 So yes, ma'am. You could submit yours uh by tomorrow. Since okay. You thank you. Was your first class. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank yeah. you. And again, um, it is you're gonna get a grade, and it is attached to your twenty percent. Um. But again, it's just for practice to um, ensure that you know you see what type of questions could be asked. You know, the midterm is is I think on this is it on the 16th? Let me just pull up the agenda. Fair. That's February 23rd, eh? Yeah, February 23rd. Okay, so. On the 16th, there is uh, the review class. Okay. So tonight we're gonna discuss chapter eight and mm -hmm. then we're going to have review class on the 16th and then the exam is gonna be on the 23rd where you actually go into um, BIFs and sit that exam. Okay, so okay. Ms. Dean will be expecting you. Okay, so we want everybody to be clear. I'm, I'm just trying to pull it up on the screen. Um, oh, so that's the midterm, that's the midterm exam. You're talking about going into PIPs? Yes. Okay. Uh, what time are we looking at doing that exam? It's from 6 to 9 p.m. I can read the right to Yeah, so everybody has this um, agenda, correct? Including. Yes, ma'am, I have it. Yes, ma'am. Is it yeah, I, or Tanisha? Tanishka. Tanishka. Okay. So if we look at the agenda, um, mm -hmm. chapter eight, we did the quiz. We're going to cover chapter eight tonight. Um, mm. I asked for the homework by, I guess I didn't put it in writing, but you discussed it to be sent in by Sunday. Okay. Um, for the most part, I received everybody's homework. Next week um, is a very special week. Everybody knows what's going to happen next week. What's happening next week? <laughs> Valentine's? Yeah, yeah, Valentine's. But So for our Valentine's um, celebration in our first class, we would have gone over a speech and we would have each come up with some questions. Um, there are also some sample questions on the mentoring sheet that you could have used. And then you will do a pre presentation based on the question that you would have chosen for the, for the speech. Okay, so all the information is on the, the handout. Tanishka, did you, did you see that on the mentoring Yes, I, handout? I saw it, yes. Ma okay, and you had the opportunity to read the speech? Uh-huh. Okay, okay, good. And so we are, we are all up to date there. So hold yeah. on, I have a question. So the, um, we have to send this, e we have to send the email in with our speech when? On Sunday. Okay, make sure I have that down. And then we present it on? On the 9th, on February 9th. And this is not in person, right? No, it's not in person, but you have to turn on your camera. So next class, February 9th, everybody please be prepared to, to have your cameras on. Can, is it possible that we can do the summer school that before that day? Or we have to do it on that day? Um, some of you can perhaps do it on the 16th. When would when would you do it before? Let me see. Or oh, the 16th is the following week. Right. Okay. Yeah. So you are not going to be here on the 9th? I don't think so, but I'll try my best to be there'll be some place that I could present, but I will definitely have to work into you on the 7th. Okay, okay, so just let me know. And then would the 16th be better? You want me just to schedule you for the 16th? But I think the 16th is the day we could be doing the review. I, let me, let me get my yeah, mind. but we, we won't need three hours to do the review. So that's why we I scheduled it that way. So if persons, you know, if the time goes on, we could, you know, have one or two on the 16th and that won't be an issue. Okay. Okay. So yes, let's just go through um, the questions. Everybody, everybody has their questions. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So let's 
Let's go down the list. Let me see where my papers. Because I know some of you gave a question and then said you want to change your mind. So, um, Ms. Buller, just, just one other question. Mm -hmm. uh, the midterm will consist of all of the previous chapters, or how would that be constructed? Would it be chapters 9, 8, 3, 12, 1 as well? Yes. So all the chapters that we have covered so far, um, we normally have a test bank and we, we pull um, questions from the test bank. And so in the review class, um, we'll, we'll perhaps discuss it and I'll give um, each of you an opportunity. So what I would do after this class is um, perhaps, you know, I don't want you overwhelmed. So on Sunday, or perhaps on Friday, but by the end of the week, I mean, when I feel like you're finished with your paper and ready to submit, I'll send a review sheet. Um, it'll probably just have 10 topics on it um, based on what's gonna be on the midterm and I'll give everybody an opportunity to answer and share, um, you know, how they would propose answering the question or, you know, and we go through the chapters one by one, okay? I'll send out a review sheet. Thank you. Okay, great. Great. So, in terms of um, the final topics, yeah, can can we confirm with topics? Can somebody mute their yes, mic because we're getting some background noise? Okay, so good. Um, so I guess somebody's some mic is still going in the back. No, okay, good. Okay, so again, we're clear where we're at. We had the homework which would have been, if we were in person, would have been like our quiz one. And for the most part, everybody got very um, high grades. So very good. At, at least you know where to go in the book to look for the answers, or you would have retained some of the information that was said. So I was very pleased with the grades that we got. Um, in the homework, I was a bit disappointed that I didn't receive any, everybody's homework. And so really the only person's homework I didn't expect to receive was Tanishka because she just joined last week and she's going to hand that in tomorrow. And so if you haven't sent in your homework quiz, just at this point, don't worry about it. Um, you try and make it up, I, I guess, in the midterm or um, when we have the second um, set of homework um, in sometime in March. Okay, so speeches next week. Everybody's going to be prepared. We're gonna have our cameras on um, and we are going to present. Then the following week, we'll have a review for, for the midterm. On the midterm, on February 23rd, you will go into BIFS and Ms. Dean will be expecting you and the midterm should between, be between six, it, really six and eight, because it, it, it won't be three hours long, so about two hours and, and you should, it should be sufficient. Okay, and I will send out a review sheet. And on the 16th, each of us will, you know, have an opportunity to go through, you know, with the expectations is, or, you know, answer some of the questions. Okay, Claire's mud. Wait, you have a question? Crystal. Okay, good. Go ahead with your question. I you go first? Mm -hmm, go ahead. Oh. What's the details of the, the speech assignment? I really didn't like getting written like in detail. I apologize. Okay, so you didn't listen to the recording? No, I haven't. Okay, so call Miguel and ask Miguel to uh, give you the recording from the first class because we would have actually read. Did you read the speech? I glanced it. When I saw it, it was eight pages, I got a bit overwhelmed and I was like, I'll come back to this. Okay, yeah, okay, so um, ask Miguel to give you, and I guess both you and Tanishka, Tanishka, sorry, to get the recording from the first class, right. and then there's a handout um, that talks about mentoring, and it gives you instructions on what, what you need to do. Okay. Okay? All right, thank you. If you, have, if you have any questions, just ask one of your classmates, so, and if that fails, then 
you can come back to me, but please don't wait until, um, you know, the due date, which is Sunday, to say that you you don't know what needs to be done. Okay. Okay? All right, thanks. Okay, you're welcome. And then, it, okay, so if some of us are not up to power with the speech, have we selected the person that we are going to mentor? And because that's our second um, presentation that's going to be um, presented on March the 30th, and you're supposed to mentor somebody over a six week period and document the process. Have we even started to look at that as yet? Yes. Okay, so have you selected your person? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, and how is it going so far? Um, it's um it's a it's it's a very interactive experience. Um you get to um I guess you get to you get to experience I guess the mindset of like the younger generation, like the Gen X, the Gen X generation, and you could compare, contrast um the way you've actually been in an entry level position and compare it to them. And you could just show them, like give them guidance and give them advice on how to perform procedures and just how to do it differently. So, or in a more innovative way that they could understand and retain information. So, I mean, at first it was a bit challenging, but once they get comfortable with doing the processes and they actually gain that confidence in you as a, I guess as a leader or, or as a pair to pair leader, then things become more easily and then the relationship starts to grow. And so, I mean, at the end, it's kind of rewarding. Okay. Okay. Very good. Okay. Um, Denise, what about you? I know in the beginning, um, you weren't certain about who you should mentor. How, did you make a decision? I did. And I have, I mean, I did approach the person and um, they were kind of hesitant at first, I guess, probably because um, maybe I'm not, you know, higher level per se. And maybe they were feeling, I don't know. Um, but the relationship, we still kind of feeling out one another. Um, we still trying to get there. Let me put it like that. Um, it's going, it's, it's definitely going. Um, the, the person hasn't, they have an open mind. And so we're dealing with it. Um, she's asking questions and I try as best to answer, um, but we're getting there. Let me put it like that. <laughs> okay, and I, I hope, you know, you'll get through it and um, both of you find it beneficial as we know. And again, right. guys, you know, tell, you know, explain to her that it's for a class and, you know, it's called supervisory skills. And so essentially we want to practice, uh, you know, and do a practical part of the class where we actually go out there and test our skills of listening and comprehending and, you know, sharing our knowledge. Right. And so hopefully, you know, in the end, it, I'm certain, like I said, after you build the trust in, on the communication level, of, you know, um, things should be get be better, hopefully. Okay. It's getting there. Okay, it's great. getting okay. there. Okay, great. Okay, anybody else having any challenges or? I, um, I have a question. Um, I am looking at these questions. This is on the project, the paper that's list on the projects and presentations with the key ingredients and mentoring relationships. The questions that are in the back, on the back sheet, the third page. Um, mm -hmm. These are the questions that are expected for us to ask, to ask oh, the person okay. we are mentoring. So again, that's a, just an example of question. If you show somebody that you work with, mm -hmm. that was just some example questions that you could perhaps ask the person because you got to work yeah. together. But if you pick somebody from church, or another organization or just a friend, then it, it will not be relevant. So that was only examples. Yeah. It doesn't have example questions <laughs> that you could possibly ask. It was just to give you like a tip. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I'm trying to get a 
go ahead. So I trying to get a proper understanding of what 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 are we putting in this paper that we're writing? I understand you want us, we want you want us to mentor somebody, right? Mm -hmm. What like what are we getting from the relationship? What are we what 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 let's just say someone we do work with? What I, I don't understand. Okay, so if it's somebody that you do work with, you're going to, you know, share an experience or teach them something that they 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 don't know, right? Correct. Okay. okay. And so in the beginning of there's a list. I think you have this scheduled time, and you will say we decided to meet once a week or on a Saturday for two hours, what have you. And then this is how we establish trust. I explain to the person that you know when I was entry level um it was difficult and I see the need um for mentorship because you know in my day and I guess I knew from my own experience you know it was like a sink, sink or swim type of um situation and you know everybody some people sank and so to avoid that I see the importance of proper training or proper um sharing of knowledge and you know holding somebody's hand until they get comfortable in their position. And so I'm here to offer that to you, you know, so that, that that's what you would document. I understand. Yeah, and just the experience. And if the person found it beneficial, would did you all accomplish and, you know, and so you, you just document the whole process. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Yes. Uh, I haven't started officially yet because you know you have to get the time aligned with the individual. What is the um, what is the time limit on this uh, the presentation? I know we have it on March 30th. So is it a particular time when you start February or you just go from this particular point moving forward? Well, how many weeks do we have now? One, two, three, four, five. Where are we? Which we got be second one, second. two, three, four, five, six, seven. So there are seven weeks. It's supposed to be over a six week period. So you seven weeks are left. So right around this time, you know, it'd be a good time to get started, you know, to, to document, you know. But again, it depends on when you're available. And I know a lot of persons are busy and it's it's difficult now to be in person because everybody's doing things by Zoom. So I know there may be some roadblocks, but you know, um, try to document as much as possible. We don't want you to take one night and say, okay, I mentored this person in one day. You know, we want it to actually be effective and it'll be good training ground for when you actually do become a supervisor and you have about 10 persons looking to you for, for, for leadership and scheduling and trust and to be able to communicate. So it, it's good practice. Understood. Now. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. Very good. Okay. So good that we are clear on what is required. Um, anybody read chapter eight? No. <laughs> Nobody read chapter eight. Okay. So we do understand that this this class is discussion based and you are to read the chapter and then you come to class and we, we discuss, you know, various scenarios that, that happened in the, um, the chapter. We, we, uh, we, Ms. Ms. we Bullard, are aware. Yeah? Uh, this was the psychology chapter. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. It talks about the philosophers. Um, okay. We don't have much of them around anymore. I know back in the day it was like Aristotle and Maslow and Harrisburg, but Socrates. of late have you yeah, right. Of late have you heard of you know, is this a thing of the past? Uh, and the only thing we have now is like conspiracy theories. We don't have um, people trying to, you know, create new models for us to follow, no? Yeah. Uh, I know how to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, have you heard? Have you heard of any? Anybody? Maybe? Not off the top of my head, no. Yeah, me either. I haven't heard about anything that that stuck. 
And I guess it takes a while too for people to actually believe um, that it, it works. Okay. But anyway, um, chapter eight talks about motivation. Okay. And where I, I will start with asking um, where does motivation come from or um, how is one motivated? Okay. And the book says that motivation is the willingness to do something conditioned upon the actions ability to satisfy some need for the individual. And then a need is a physiological or psychological deficiency that makes certain outcomes seem attractive. Okay, and so when we talk about motivation, what, where does motivation come from? Or who motivates you? Or how are you motivated? I think that, uh, like the chapter mentioned, so it has to be something that you want individually, whether it's Kaizen or the Japanese philosophy of self-improvement, or it could be because of your position, whether being a family man or a man who's career-driven. There are many other, many factors that drive us to do whatever we do. Okay, very good. And so essentially what you're saying is, that motivation comes from within, correct? Yes, ma'am, the, the okay. internal drive. Good, good, very good. And so for the most part, a lot of people feel like the company should motivate you or their supervisor should motivate them or it's somebody else's responsibility to, to motivate. But, sorry, Tanisha, you said something? Sorry, now I was talking to my nephew. My apologies. Okay. Yeah. So essentially, you know, the, the organization does play a part and, you know, they can contribute to helping you remain motivated. But truly, that motivation has to come from within. Okay. So this chapter eight talks about motivation, then various theories, um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, are we familiar with Maslow, um, Abraham Maslow, and the hierarchy of needs or theory X and theory Y from McGregor? Are any of us familiar with that? I heard about Maslow before, but I didn't know who the actual person's name, but the hierarchy of needs, I heard about that uh, a few years back. Uh, it was interesting. It's true, but it's interesting. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so am I. I'm familiar with the hierarchy. Yeah, needs. Okay. Okay. And so again, um, again, these were um, philosophers from the 1950s, and they came up with these various theories on motivation and how it works. And so if none of us read this chapter other than Kendrick and Tanisha, then that means we have to sit down and read most of this book, correct? And so part of this class is 10% for participation. And so I think one or two of us did really well in the first class, but now I need to start deducting points for persons when I call their name who don't respond. And then, you know, continuously, how, how, how are we gonna participate if, if we did not read the chapter? We can't be overwhelmed every, every week at, at a certain point, we have to realize that we spent some money, anybody here for free? No, everybody would have paid. We spent our money. And so we wanna we could have gone on a trip. We could have bought a nice bag. We could have, you know, gone to put it towards a vacation, but we made a commitment, you know, to bettering ourselves. And so therefore we want to get the best out of the commitment that we made. Correct? Yes. Okay, great. So we have to participate because we want to pass over. But again, if you do not submit your homework you do not get the 20%, um, you know, if you're lowering your chances for getting the 20%. If you do not um, do the presentations, then you have, have an incomplete overall in the class, okay? If you do not, not attend Rotary, Kiwanis, or Toastmasters, then you don't get the extra 5%. And so, and then if you don't participate, then you get 10%. So you have to get a really, really high grade on this um, midterm and final exam. And so there are a lot of um, avenues to 
go sit into these exams comfortably, you know, so please take advantage of them. You know, because for the most part. Yes, yes uh, go ahead. I I just saw the email today for the invite for the Rotary Club. Is that going to be done every every week or would suggest for today? I don't know. You have to go out and do research and go online. And so those ones came to my email. And so I shared them with the class just in case, you know, some of you are having difficulties going into a class, but you can just visit their Facebook page or you could go to Google and okay. all the advice will come up for the various clubs. Okay. okay. I tried to log into that today. I wasn't able to. Okay. Ms. Butler? Yeah? Yeah. For me, I am on a Cubana's board for Central Abaco. So, I mean, if this, that count as my participation. Okay, but you would have to share with us what, because the, that's the Central Abaco one that having it on um, uh, this one, I think tomorrow. Thursday. Thursday and what's the what's the topic for Thursday? Well, I haven't been on it last week, so I can't say right now. Okay, and for then, if, if you can send out an invite to the you know the class members who perhaps want to attend with somebody you know who's familiar, that would be nice. And then okay. you have, you have to come to the class, and then you have to actually share with us what what happened in the meeting. Okay. Somebody okay. please tell me that there is an afternoon one. That the one between one and two today. I'm I traditionally take lunch between two thirty and three thirty. So unfortunately for me I was unable to meet to go to that particular one. There's one on Thursday at seven thirty. Somebody shoot that to me, please. Uh min seven ten at gmail dot com, all lowercase. I'll just send me the invite, please. Ms. Bullard sent it to us. Sorry. Send that, send that Maybe. That's the flyer that you sent for Abaco. That's on Thursday. I, no, I know I sent one for Abaco. I don't, I can't remember if it was uh, Rotary or Kiwanis. It was for Kiwanis. Okay, so. Who, who was saying that? Who was speaking when they said that they are on the board? Barbaco? Tanishka. Tanishka, okay. Yeah, so that flyer, I would have sent out already to most persons. I don't know if I, I copied everybody, but I know one or two persons who had asked for it, I, I sent it out. Okay, okay, good. Yeah, so like I said, there are a lot of um, ways you can have your full points at the end of the class, or like I said, sit in the exam, comfortably, so please take advantage of it. And so now, so you persons that don't answer me when I call your names, do not get your reduction to get 10 points, please participate and talk back to me and uh, let's get some feedback and let's understand exactly um, what chapter eight talks about, okay? Because persons complain about, about when we read too much, but we have to if the majority of the class has not read and they don't know what I just talking, 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 and they don't even know what Miss Bullard is talking about. Okay. Okay. Yes, okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> okay. So again, we were um on talking about the philosophers back in the day who came up with these various theories about um, motivation. And like I said, we are just gonna read some of this um, from the persons who are in my customer service class, they should be familiar with um, Maslow because we covered that in customer service and theory X and theory Y. But Abraham Maslow um, created a hierarchy of needs theory that states that a satisfied need no longer creates tension and therefore does not motivate. And he proposed that every human being, in, in every human being there exists a hierarchy of five needs. And it's physiological, which includes hunger, thirst, shelter, sex, and body, bodily needs, 
Safety includes security, protection from physical and emotional harm. Social includes affection, a sense of belonging, acceptance and friendship. Esteem includes internal factors such as self-respect, autonomy and achievement, and then self-actualization, the drive to become the one that is capable, sorry, what the drive to become, what one is capable of becoming includes growth, achieving one's potential and self-fulfillment. And so do we agree with Abraham Maslow when he says that once a need is satisfied, it no longer creates tension? I, I could agree and I could disagree because if a person, let's say for instance, you achieve the bonus that you did. Like if there was a bonus at the end of the year, let's say you got $5,000 and that, that was the bonus. That was a goal that you had. The fact that you got that actually inspires most people more to a teen more. So I don't know if it's really, if it really satisfies or satisfy because for most people it's more like more like a uh, sorry Kendrick somebody's background noise I didn't hear the last thing that you said no what basically I was saying okay if I where is it where is where is the diagram diagram that he mentioned where he says that the need basically an unsat unsatisfied need it, it, causes increased tension. Uh, um, for me personally, if I accomplish a goal at this particular point, I got the bonus. All right. Am I just going to be satisfied or do I want to exceed that? So it doesn't really, per se, decrease the tension. What it actually does is propel me further because I'm a teen more and go beyond where I was the previous year. It just motivates me to go get more, but it doesn't really relax. Because when you start relaxing, that means you become satisfied and complacent and stagnant. Okay, okay, that's, that, that's fair. But in that moment, when you would have said that, um, you know, your manager, you would have said growth in January, um, the pandemic happened, but at the end of the year, you still would have met the goals. You know, will, will you still be motivated or will you feel like accomplished? Or are you saying, I met that goal now, the following year, I must set another goal or, you know? I got to surpass where I was last year. You got to surpass. I, that's, how, that's why I look at it as growth. I don't care if it's by one feet. I surpass where I went the previous year okay okay understood okay so maslow says that the key to motivation is to determine when an individual is along the needs hierarchy because remember that he said there are five needs within each of us and so his theory is really saying once one level in the order that he said physiological safety social esteem then self-actualization um once physiological needs, which is thirst and hunger, um, are satisfied, then we will worry about safety. But if we are hungry, then we ain't really concerned about safety. And we definitely ain't concerned about social. Okay? So, Blakely, do you remember this from customer service? Yeah, I remember. Okay, and so do do you remember the story that I told that I said once, you know, so we want to test Maslow's hierarchy and we want to see if it's it's actually true or was he just a philosopher that, that put out a theory that didn't make sense? Do you, can you recall? Um, vaguely, yeah. I remember you telling the story about it. Okay. Okay, so again, just for everybody else's benefit, just to prove that um, his hierarchy of needs, once a need is satisfied, there's no, it no longer creates tension. Um, I always tell the story that, you know, I'm on the way to Memorial Day weekend in the States and ready to party and have a good time. 
and I'm worrying about my outfits and I have enough money and where we're going to go to socialize. And so right now my need is social. But on my flight over there, turbulence starts to happen in the airplane. Am I so concerned about my social need? What, no. what happens once the airplane, they say, please pack your seatbelt, we about to have turbulence or we may have to crash land. That's safety. Right. Yeah. So right. the social is automatic. Yeah, can't go to your mind, go okay. straight to being safe. Yeah. Right. 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 Exactly. I should get the party <laughs> now. We on our knees and everybody in prayer and we making sure that anything possible we could do to help this plane land safely. Okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. if, right. If we don't land safely, then definitely we will not have a party. Okay? So in some aspects, depending on which way you look at it, yeah, Maslow's theory is correct. And, you know, it, once it's satisfied, it no longer creates attention. Or if the need before it is not satisfied, then you don't worry about it. If my safety need is not um, satisfied, then I'm not worrying about being social. If I'm hungry and I'm thirsty and I live on the streets, I, I live on the streets. I, I really care. I don't have nothing for anybody to steal. You know, I can't feed myself, so therefore, my, what my yeah, they, <laughs> okay. So that's basically what Maslow's hierarchy of needs um, um, deals with. And again, we're gonna come back. I'm just giving you a, a high level overview. We're gonna come back and read some of this, some of the stories that I told you. It's a very good book and um, it gives very good examples, okay? And then there's um, McGregor, Douglas McGregor. There's a theory on theory X called theory X and theory Y. And basically McGregor said that supervisors, a supervisor's view of human nature is based on a certain grouping of assumptions and that he or she tends to mold behavior towards subordinates according to those assumptions. And so on the theory X, there are four assumptions held by supervisors, which are employees inherently dislike work and whenever possible will attempt to avoid it. Because employees do dislike work, they must be coerced, controlled, or threatened with punishment. Like how I threatened you all a couple of minutes ago, and I say, if you all don't participate, no 10 points. If there's no speech and no presentation, incomplete, you can't pass the class, right? All those are threats, right, from Ms. Bullard, right? To achieve the desired goal. Employees will shirk responsibilities and seek formal direction whenever possible. Most workers play security above all factors associated with work and will display little ambition. In contrast to these negative views towards the nature of human beings, McGregor listed four other assumptions that he called theory work. So employees can view work as being as natural as rest or play. A person will exercise self-direction and self-control if he is committed to the objective and the average person can learn to accept even seek responsibility. The ability to make good decisions is wide, widely dispersed throughout the population and it's not necessarily the sole province of supervisors. So, sorry, who, are we on? Sorry, you were saying something? Which page are we on? 195. Okay. 195. Okay, we good? So are we? Are we theory X or theory Y? And again, like I said, I'm just giving an overview. We're going to come back and read some of this. Uh, 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 some of us would, Kendra, what, what, what type of supervisor would you be? Would you be a, a theory X supervisor or would you be a, a theory Y? Or a little bit of both? I think you have to have to be a little bit of both. Okay. So which, which, which ones do you agree with? Do you, you think employees dislike work and whenever possible will avoid it? Uh, I think some people can be like that, but I wouldn't generally, um, <laughs> I wouldn't say all persons are like that, but there are a few. If they can get out of work, they will get out of it. Okay. But then, then you said, so which part of theory Y do you agree with? I think I would look at if it's theory why 
I tend to lean towards number two, a person will exercise self-discretion and self-control. If he or she is committed to the objective, I think that most people, when they come to work, they have an idea of what they need to fulfill. And I think for the most part, the majority of people do. I just think that uh, like persons group a whole, you know, they group people together and they would stigmatize that particular group based upon the actions of one or two persons in the group and not the group as a whole. Okay. So you think that the people, people that are going to work, you know, we always talk about corporate Bahamas and all of, you know, the way it is and how it needs to change. And, um, you know, most people hate going to work. Do you really think from the persons or not from, from the individual side, the people actually know what their uh, institution's objectives are? Remember, we started off in this class where we asked, go out and get the mission and the, the values and the, all of that. Did we do that? Uh, yes, we did, ma'am. Yeah, you did that, but everybody else. Did, do we now, uh, how many of us are in this class now? 10 participants. Do we all know now what the vision, um, mission statement is of our company, the objectives? Do we actually know what they are? All of us? Yuri, you know? Okay, Yuri and answer me. Okay, but I'm just saying, yeah? I would think, I, I don't speak for everybody, but I think everyone- I, You know, you won't, you won't have to shame me like that. I was waiting for my computer for a minute. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I read it last week. Okay, okay. Read it last week online, yeah. Okay, Yuri. And so was there any surprises in there or it was what you um, thought it would be? No, no, no. It it, it, it not my expectation. Okay, but were you going to work trying to meet these objectives that you didn't even know what they were? Well, verbatim, no, but based on my, based on my other superiors and seeing how they, um, how they perform and how they guided me, then I knew I came to work to, to work and not play around. So I just followed, I just followed their, followed that direction. Okay. And so suppose you was working for government. I, I mean, I don't know where you work, but suppose you was working for government. You don't work for sure. government. Eh? Nobody no, in here works for government. Eh? Not that I say in something wrong with the government, right? But I just say, and we know that's a stress. Sorry, somebody speaking? What are you trying to say? No, I'm trying to say none, Margaret. I'm just saying we know that there's a systemic problem in all governments around the world. That's why I didn't say Bahamian government, but just in the government institutions, you know how um, the attitude is, right? So Yuri, if he was working for government, you think it would have been safe to not know the values and the mission and, and just watch what the people do? Of course. Um, no, I don't. I don't think. I don't think that would be wise. I think, like, if you in a in a setting like the government sector, I think you have to have like a lot of self motivation or have like a lot of self drive. Or putting yourself actually in the in like the customer's position to actually be like a good worker because if you feel like if you put yourself in a customer's position to be like oh I in this government office all day and I haven't achieved anything then I think you will like take a take more pride like in your work and what you do. Okay, okay, Margaret was offended. Sorry, Margaret. Sorry, <laughs> Margaret. Come on, we want offend the government employees, please. We listen in. No, no, I don't work. I don't work for the government, but I mean, I feel like, okay, some <laughs> organizations, which I guess you could use the government, some companies, they have these mission statements, you know, the vision of the company, all these different things, core values, but like it's just on a piece of paper. Okay, great, great. I think that's the issue for most companies. Like it's just there. So I guess when you go to orientation, it's there. Um, you know, when they give you the little booklet, sorry, the handbook, it's there. If there's a meeting training, it's there, but I mean, you know, it's just like, it's just there. And I guess the government would be a prime example of something like this, but probably some com um, other organizations as well. Okay, you, you're right. And I don't know if we remember the famous story with Martha Stewart and Enron. A part of her trial was after they did the investigation and she went to jail, they found that there were 
a whole lot of, they had uh, values, goals, mission statements, um, visions, everything. But again, it was written very eloquently, but nobody knew. None of the staff knew, and they definitely didn't include it in trainings, and they didn't um, disseminate it to the organization. So again, one of the charges that came out of that was that they wrote a bunch of baseless statements and nobody, you know, never shared it. So you are correct. And so a lot of companies do have these visions and, and they do exactly the opposite. Um, I always talk about um, Superwash. Superwash has press whilst you wake. Correct? Two hours. Oh. I have never, ever been able to get my clothes back in two hours. And one time I did... You know, I was at my um, machine wasn't working. I said, I'm going to wash and dry whilst my clothes are pressed. And I asked the lady, I said, is it possible that I get my press closed by them? So I finished washing and drying, would have, which would have been like three hours. And she looked at me like, Miss, how dare I ask for that? <laughs> and then another woman come out the back and say, if I give her 10 extra dollars, um, then it could be ready in two hours. Wake it up. Wake it up. Is that sign up there not saying press whilst you wait? I am that's, not going to say. I have to. I need to go there. That's, and that. that's signage only. That's only signage. That's this is exactly. Said. This is what we're saying. Okay, but let me get. Let, let me draw this closer to home. What about the cable Bahamas and now the banks pick it up? You call the bank and you know what the voicemail says. Please leave a message and we'll call you back in two hours. Who says this? The bank. The bank voicemail. If you call which, somebody which, at the which bank, bank now. <laughs> listen, listen. Oh, Lord. Yeah. Let me, let me, let me see. <laughs> Who I called recently? I, I think it was you called Trinidad friend. or Jamaica. Trinidad or Jamaica. No, I so well, first of all, that's an thing. Line. They outsource the the call centers, so you can't even get through to the bank. But if you happen to get somebody's regular this line, like they sound like RBC or Voice Caribbean. Yes, yeah, RBC. They have <clears> voicemail. <throat> they're, oh, they're, sorry, sorry. <laughs> their voicemail says, "Leave a man But this the truth. Being the ain't on them. <laughs> That is the truth. So why we can't? And, and uh, Kendrick, I want to. I, I read something that made me talk. Um, think about you the other day, where it says silence is pervasive. Have you ever heard that before? Say that again. I didn't get so far. Silence is pervasive. Mm, no, I've never heard that one before. No. Okay. So what? When I was reading about what are the um, major problems in institutions. That, that was uh, what they, the article talked about. This is silence is pervasive. And for years, persons have been so afraid to speak up for fear of loss of a job or, or what have you. And now the problems are systemic because everybody was threatened if they spoke up. And so nobody ever speaks up or everybody say above my pay grade or I'm getting involved or in my problem. But we truly make up That's the truth. That's true. Yeah, so now the problem has become systemic and the whole, it, almost every corporate institution that you walk in has the same problem. People are afraid to speak up. When you speak up, you are victimized and nothing has been ever done. And so now we have corporate Bahamas needing to go down the, the sewer drain because persons are showing up almost suicidal. To work. Okay, so we have to get um, past all of these, I guess, the status quo and how everybody feels and start to fix these things. Because, yes. Can it, can it, um, uh, I agree with what you say. Uh, we are timid when it comes to speaking up. It almost has to get to a point where we are completely angry to truly say exactly what we feel. Um, on the flip side of that, you reference a certain group of people, okay, uh, who said that when you go into a particular place, unless you tip in and nothing happen or whatever the case may be, those persons have become emboldened because of union representation. And here it is, certain other persons are timid because nobody wants to lose their jobs. And ultimately, I think that a lot of employers use that baseball bat over the heads of employees. That's why a lot of people are just not uh, going to speak out on a lot of things. I'm not saying that I won't, 
But what I'm saying is that if every one of us in the USA say, okay, we can talk to Ms. Bullock about this midterm exam. We didn't think that this is right. I say, okay, let's go talk. When you reach, only one person talking and everybody else either didn't show up or silent as a lab. Agreed. 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 But how, what would what, what Ms. Bullock do? Make it harder? I go make it out of if y'all no see and that's just it. This is why we need trained individuals. We want people who could accept constructive criticism. We want people to understand, and this is what the book talks about. We now work in a diverse um country Goodness, where well, we have many yeah. different types of nationalities. Gone are the days when everybody looks like us, talks like us, and wants the same things. And so now we have to open up our minds and we have to accept diversity because who makes up the organization? Each and each one of us does. And we don't all look the same. We don't think the same. And so we need to train enough persons to be open to change, open to diversity, and open to other person's point of view. I had a department, I had 10 persons in that department, and for innovation was on everybody's job description. Everybody had to come up with something. Everybody had to brainstorm. Everybody had to make a contribution. I was not, because I was the manager, I was not the department. In fact, I could not even function. And I think I told you all this um, story that the scanners reported to me and the recent job that I was on, I did not scan and the people was, I saw them emailing back and forth that she used to be the manager or the document control room and she don't know how to scan. No, I didn't know. I did not know, you know? And so that's just how effective, I, I, I don't think I wasn't able to supervise them because I didn't know how to physically do it, but I understood when something went wrong, I understood the policy, I understood the procedure, but to, to say carry out the action, no, I didn't know how to do it. We have to change the culture. Okay, there you go. And how do I have another? Let me follow that up with another question. How do we change the culture when our political figures are the very ones who would stand over individuals who would speak out over them? If the ones in the ones ultimately who are in charge of this country are the ones who actually use the baseball bat same syndrome, how mm -hmm. do we change that? Um, um, good question, Kendrick. We we live in we have to brainstorm and we have to come up with solutions, but what we can no longer do is just accept it the way it is because it's a broken system. We have to start to fix it. We live in an era where if you tell the truth, you used to outcast and everybody lies and everybody appeases each other and everybody's afraid to speak up or it ain't none of my business or that's husband and wife. You don't get a husband and wife. No, nobody is given good counsel. So everybody is living a, you know, that's why the suicide rate so much, you know, higher you ask somebody's point of view, they don't, they have nothing to say. They don't want to give you, they don't want to tell you the truth any longer. And when you do tell the truth, you are outcast. We live in a society where the president of the United States is wife, where women, you know, sometimes men are a little stubborn, but women are supposed to, you, you know, be compassionate. They're supposed to be virtuous and what have you. And she is standing up while she is not attending an inauguration, not inviting, which is a, a pleasantry or common courtesy, what it was to invite the, uh, the move first lady to the White House, where she is standing up and saying in one voice, um, we must put country above self as she leaves to go to Mar Lago. Okay, how are you putting country against self if you did not invite the people to the White House? You did not attend the inauguration. How? Oh, what you? But why would they invite them if they didn't attend the inauguration? No, but I'm I, just saying it's a tradition. It's an age-old yes. tradition. And if you are saying out of your mouth that I must put country, or are you encouraging people to put country above self? Are you putting country above self? Mm, that, that's a sticky boy. Yeah, that's, that's what I said. That looks sticky for me. That, 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 that looks different. That sticky for me. I would be biased, so I just leave that alone. Yeah, but that's I, what I mean. Are you putting country above self? No. So, okay, so there, there it is. And nobody, there's no outcry. There's no... Uh, you know, and I guess it's back to our parents 
do what I say, not as I do it. Uh, and so we have, yes, we have had too many bad examples, right? I so, think, go ahead, go ahead. You have talked too much already. Sorry, I just want to say, right, based on what y'all was saying earlier, like a lot of the stuff that we are exposed to, the younger generation now, we, we the things that we're exposed to, we get this experience through schooling, through speaking with older people or whatever. Our predecessors, they didn't have this kind of exposure, number one. Mm -hmm. They are so set in their ways that in order for us to change the system, we need to move them. Like, I feel like... Oh, you talk, no, ooh. I'm serious. No, ooh. no, seriously. Denise, no. Denise, Denise, what I'm I saying is, you have a... I hold on, you... Listen, what I'm saying is, you have a lot of people, let's say, in government again, who are older than 65, past retirement, older but than are still working. Years. They're still working. But still won't come back, that, but anyway. That means... Exactly. That means that job a younger person who have had cultural experience, been off to school, diversity experience, interact with other nationality, who bring a new, a fresher, more innovative mind frame to this job cannot get this position because this person with this old mindset refuses to leave because this person is friend with that person. I'm, I, I think in order for us to change the system, we have to change a lot of things that are in place now. When I say things in place, I mean a lot of the people who have this mind frame are not willing to open up and see do new perspective. And that's the only way I feel we'll change it. Okay. And Denise, I think you're very, very right. But what, what is happening? Um, we are the future leaders. Are we going out there and making ourselves available to take this country over and be good representation? Are we going to keep are. current? Um, you know, we because are, you know, we are people we are. who have been in the government. If you look at it, um, they are rearing up their children. Yes. You know, and their we family members to get the next spot. So oh, essentially, God. you will have those same. Old, I guess, precepts, same old standards, same old ways to the son or to the daughters. And it, it goes back to motivation that we were spoke, speaking of because, like you say, they're, they're grooming their kids and their grandkids and their son in law and daughter in law for these positions. Mm -hmm. Correct. However, we have by far more experienced, more intelligent, more intellectual mm -hmm. people who who've been off to school, who have actually been in these positions and who have held higher, more prestigious, more, sorry, prestigious. And because- Of who they know. Of who, you know, it, it's, it, I think we, we have the experience. We just have the heart, we just have the motive, have the motive, find the motivation to get them to actually want to take these jobs. Yeah, and then- Not you know, just that, a lot of persons can't have the experience because too, because they won't free, they wouldn't, we can't have the experience if they in the position. That's another thing too. Because if you look at a lot of these job ads, um, you have to be bilingual, like really look at the newspaper, some of them, um, 20 years of experience, this, that, the next, like they literally tell, some of them actually, they literally tell you this, this job ain't for you. Okay. A lot, you, a lot right. of job ads. So then that's just it, Margaret. Do we, what do we do? We hear all the issues, right? what are the solutions and and, and uh, it's good to document like write down what you said write down what Denise said write down what Kendrick said there has to be a solution for each of those problems we can no longer just sit back and allow it to spiral out of control okay well, so that's true, that's true. I, I think we, this... we work in these organizations we go well, to work know, taking our job every day I know I know one of the things that you guys are talking about um, you say you can persons can go to their supervisor because the supervisor can you know, get in trouble or lose their job and stuff like that. But I think, too, is a lot of persons need to handle conflict better. 
or constructive criticism better because not because you're telling me something, not because you're telling me a supervisor something means you're, you're, you as the person with saying it is, again, is in a constructive way. Mm -hmm. so uh, a lot of employees like to talk, you know, just like talking, talking about the supervisor and like little petty stuff like that. And I think if we learn to put the petty stuff aside, um, don't talk about the manager, the supervisor and go to them if there's an issue. You know what I mean? Um, like right. adults. And I think, you know, it'll, it'll come across different. As opposed right. to you already been talking with the manager, someone else can come tell your manager and now you come in the, at the manager. You see what I mean? Okay, great. I, wow. I agree with you, but again, we never, I mean, we talk Yeah, about I feel you. I feel you. I feel and you that happens that. a lot. Trust me. So you're trying to figure out why your manager don't like, you know what I mean? And there's a lot of those simple petty things. Not because you're telling me something that might be right. Not because you're telling me something and you say in a constructive way. I mean, I just saying, you might be coming at me wrong. It's so much different things. It ain't just the manager. So I'm trying to get you to sometimes it's the employee. That's all I'm trying to get you to see. It's, I think it goes back to the way that we were raised. And you know, That's true. Mm. if we've been taught how to approach things correctly, as, mm -hmm. as if I go into my manager's office and I say, listen, this is what I think. This is what I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's, you know, this is what I see being displayed. This is what the policy says that we're supposed to do. Before that, now, uh -huh. I, I'm kind of confused as to what I should be following, the standard practice mm -hmm. or the accepted practice or what actually I'm supposed to be doing in my job. Now, okay. a person can get feelings and get caught up on any feelings all they want. But the fact is, and, and sometimes it would have doesn't put a target on their back. And it's happened to me before. And I've lost my job because of it before. And, okay. and what you have to do is that you got what Shakespeare says, to thine own self, be true. <laughs> be true to thine self, be true. Yeah, to thine own self, be true. And I think that you got to be comfortable in yourself. Yes, there is, there is a chance that you can become targeted. We always hear about this thing in our society about victimization. Yeah. Whether it's in the political sector, no longer just as it happens in the political sector, it happens in families, it happens in communities, it happens in the workplace. You just got to be comfortable in yourself to be true to yourself. And if you see something, you just choose the right time to address it and speak on it. If it happens that you become targeted because of it, just become targeted of it. But at the end of the day, you can look at yourself in the mirror. I, I know, Ms. Bullard, let me share. Can I share something in personal experience? Go ahead. I had submitted my two weeks notice on a particular job that I was on, on a job that I was on, I submitted my two weeks notice. And one weekend, I saw something that was out of sorts. And so I called the next employee over and I said, you see that? That don't look, something looks wrong there. And that was used as an opportunity to fire me. Okay. Even though you had submitted your resignation. I already, I already <laughs> one week, I already one week in, right? See, this is what people try to do. Whenever you stand up and you say something, no matter how much of gospel that can be, you got to understand that it will, it probably will cost you and you probably will be targeted. But I had already submitted my two weeks notice. I had already, I was going into my second week. And then I get called in the office. They said, well, we don't like your attitude and all of this, but I'm like, well, this is before I said in my two weeks notice. Well, where is coming from? And they tell me we don't no longer want your services. You can go. And you don't And you right. So again, you don't want to work for those type of organizations. And these, uh, there's a lot of unfairness out there, and these things happen. And for the most part, most of us, you know, we are afraid to lose. That's our livelihood. We need our job, and so. If we look back again, I'm sorry for the people who are Republican and think that I keep bashing Trump, but you saw many, many persons fired, men and women, almost every week somebody was fired from his administration from speaking out against him. And basically, in the end, what was said was that what he had left was a bunch of yes men around him. And so he felt like he became indispensable. And Essentially, that was led to you know what happened at the Capitol and, and and what have you. And so, in the end, yes, um, institutions have you know they hire those people who have created you know you, you added you know join me or leave or I let you go. And so, persons are so afraid that um, 
you know, they are afraid to speak up when, you know, things are completely out of a policy or procedure or what have you, people are afraid to blow the whistle. And so again, this is why we want to ensure that enough persons are trained, enough pe um, people, um, you know, know, have ethics and um, proper training so they act ethically when they, you know, go to work. But again, we're not there yet and we have to constantly push it and we have to not only sit down and talk, but provide solutions and, and roll them out and, you know, ensure that persons are, are safeguarded, I guess, perhaps get a committee or, or something to that effect where there's more than one person, you know, um, who, who would make a decision as to, you know, whether or not you are let go or and if it's justified. Okay, so there's a lot of um, issues out there. And so on into the book, and like I said, we're gonna read most of this. It goes on to talk about how do you create an atmosphere in which employees really wanna work, okay? And it also asks, do employees really get what they expect when they go to work? And of course, I know from just the conversation that we just had, most persons would say, no, we don't, okay? So as supervisors, we wanna ensure that when we get to this position, we know exactly what to do from what not to do. Um, we are ethically, we are properly trained, we understand um, diversity. And again, like I said, we have, the Bahamas is made up of, you know, many nationalities. And so right now, um, most are embedded in this, this society. You don't even know who was who anymore. And so and it really does not matter. From thus we came, thus we will return. Okay. And so it really does not matter. But I want you all to be prepared because sometimes, you know, it does come um, as a shocker um, when we talk about diversity um, when I was the teller supervisor, and I think I told you all this story, I had a Muslim employee who said that he had to pray six times a day. And so outside of his lunch hour, he didn't need extra time to pray. And so that was very, you know, taxing Difference. on the teller lineup. And, um, you know, when I had asked to have him perhaps go to back office where he would have more time. What is that? Mm -hmm. So, you know, they said, Ms. Bullard, you can't discriminate. And I said, I don't think I'm discriminating, but if we want to accommodate him, you know, in his prayer his six times a day praying, then we, you know, it, it's not conducive with, on government payday when the line out the door and I can't deny him his prayer break, you know, so you have to be prepared for that and how we learn in that. Then I had an employee who was a seven day Venice. And of course we know what happens on Fridays or on government paydays. Or on pension day, there's no way you get, you know, and this, this event is um, not daylight, same time. There's no way you get getting out of the bank at, um, you know, before sundown. And again, it was his, his, his religion. We cannot discriminate. I had um, female tellers and I had male tellers. We had a particular dress code. I had just like, um, you know, if the girls came dressed inappropriately, I had to send them home and ask to be changed. I had some boys who came dressed inappropriately. You know, what, what, I'm out of what, what you mean dressed inappropriately? Yeah, his pants were so tight that it burst. Oh, <laughs> they burst. And then he used to walk, you know, walk into my office always over a desk, always, you know, and I don't know what type of position, always bending over somewhere and, you know, doing all these things. And yeah, and his, his pants were so tight at first. You know, but when he walked in that day, I said, these mm -hmm. tights you have on? I said, I don't know if you could bear the tights. And he said, let me go and look at the dress code. It doesn't say anything about spandex. <laughs> you know, so, Real you know, but again, you cannot discriminate. You cannot discriminate. Now we had a you can't discriminate because I I so men no, could wear tight pants. That's no, that... he he was a part of the what it is the LBGQT whatever community. Now they have so many acronyms. I don't even know how to you know. <laughs> but you can't disrespect it. He was something like that. Yeah, yeah. So you can't disrespect. And then what if, I've never had this experience. But what do you do when somebody is clearly female or male and they say? I identify as the next gender. What do you do? 
what does the laws of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas? I was just going to, I was about to answer the same question. What is, does the law say? You cannot discriminate. We behind oh. time, so we, we, our okay. laws are still the same. Our laws, oh, I ain't touching this. I'm going to leave it. Me too. We, I don't think we don't. Yeah, we don't, I don't think even we though it says that, that royal bank. That's what I was saying, Denise. I don't think first. I don't think we recognize that over here. So the, yeah, the, the, it, it's not that we. It, it it don't matter whether we recognize it or not. It's discrimination. So we do not discriminate, and they are updating the law to ensure that. But we don't have that problem in America where they had the law that said you couldn't go to the military. So I don't I'm we have one. that law here. That, yes, no, so our laws are different, but we cannot discriminate. But I'm just, I want to prepare you for the day when you do have that person who says, I am female, but I identify as male. You cannot tell okay. that person how they should dress. Okay, Ms. Ms. Bullard, I got to do what customer is services and marketing with you next. So oh. I, I heard of a situation <laughs> where an individual came into a particular financial institution dressed as a female, but his photo ID indicated that he is male and the name he was going by was female. No. So they refused him service. Let me move my... That's an easy fix. That, but you have to go fix. by whatever the, you know, the exactly. legal identification, so whatever but, his passport says. That's what you go by. But he but came addressed as a female. That's okay. <laughs> you you are to, you know for to safeguard your institution. You exactly. listen. Royal Bank had a coming out day. Okay, it was in Canada, but they sent us all the emails and said there's oh, a coming a, out a, a day. day? We, we sorry. A what day? A coming out day. Oh, okay. And they had a whole LGBT month. You know, and so all these things happen in Canada, but of course, you know, but they had like Aboriginal month and Black History Month, and you know, and so you just couldn't d discriminate against anybody, and it, especially if you were the supervisor. So if it is in your month for something that you celebrate, just like we as Black people, February is Black History Month. Sure, are, are the white yeah. people supposed to say no? I I disagree, and I'm speaking out against Black History Month, and you can't make me participate. They, they tell you when they hire you at Royal Bank, mm -hmm. we are an equal opportunity employer. We are very diverse. If you, do you have an issue working with um, LGBT, Blacks, they, all, they list everything. And if you say yes, then they don't hire you. And in fact, if you look on like, like Citibank and- um, that, You wouldn't put yes, first of all. Right, these various different websites, they, they ask you that once you apply. But that could go both ways, though, Ms. Bullard, because if you're hiring somebody, when they followed the I application was, yeah, form, okay. they would have either selected male or female. So what if you, you selected male, yeah. how can you come no, back to the, no, I hired a male. Right now, I, I hired a male, though. No, I hired a male. So you're lying on your International oh. companies have um, three categories. Binary, right? Yeah. But in the Bahamas, categories. we don't have that. We have male or female. No. You work in HR? I tell you what it's be on application. I serious what it's be on application. Okay, but but I, it so your it company depends needs on to... where they're applying to. That's, I think yeah. that's key. Where they're company, applying. Your company has to update it. That, that's the whole point of the, the understanding and preparing you now and training you just how we don't want them to discriminate against Black people and say, you know, no Blacks. You know, we would be highly offended if they say whites only, right? Correct. That's, that's, that's two different things, but okay. No, it's the same thing. It's discrimination. It's discrim There's no different. Discrim it's discrimination by race, discrimination by sex, discrimination by religion. This is nothing. Uh, the, the reason why, Ms. Ms. Bullard, I, I'm, I haven't heard any, any legislation being tabled to that effect, and I don't even think they'll probably publicize that. But, yeah, so I don't. Yeah, so. Yeah, but um, they did talk about same sex marriage after America approved it in the various states. They did um, discuss in Parliament same sex marriage. I guess I don't. And I guess I don't. I don't right. agree in favor of that. How far did they get with that? It, nothing was passed. It was still yeah, considered nothing was male and they female. Did discuss it. I think that they did discuss there it. are too many issues with our constitution, uh, the Marriage Act. Mm -hmm. I think that when they did the the last referendum that they did, 
I, I think back. when the when the general public majority voted no, then what happened? See, it takes a referendum to change yeah, but the constitution. They a referendum, and but they women still voted no, exactly. and they still switched it. So, yeah, the whole point is loaded question. You know, don't work. Sorry, that was a loaded question. Those gaming questions, they were loaded. That's okay. Yeah, it was a no, but the majority of the Bahamians did it anyway. So you majority feel like the anyway, so still we voted can't, no. We can't depend on a referendum. Anyway, so it, why waste all that money if you could still turn around and legalize it? Oh, hold on. on. So, can you feel as though the next referendum was just basic questions? Uh, I think what happened is that when they came up, I think it's a CEDAW Accord, Ms. Bullard, if you remember that, the CEDAW Accord from the U.S. that mentioned uh, same rights for women, but tied up into that, that somebody could correct me if I'm wrong, tied up in that, but mm -hmm. that accord is something relative to same-sex marriage. Remember, there were two sides, the vote yes and the vote no. And right. all the particular education was going back and forth as I to mm -hmm. what was involved in it and what wasn't involved with it. So I think the CEDAW Accord, I think it's 22 mm -hmm. nations in the Western Hemisphere who have not signed on to it publicly, from what we know, as far as I know, the government inside it. But okay. I think it's either Barbados and I think it's the Bahamas are the only two who have not signed it. Mm. So I think that our ne next referendum, we have to face it head on and deal with it head on. Because the like same as Ms. Bulletty, like you said, if we have international companies that come here, that their international practices are that you're either male, female, or binary, how you see yourself then we as a country have to deal with it and speak Absolutely. on it but and say, listen, either we for it or not. We deal with it. I'm not saying that there was no binary person in, in Royal Bank, but I'm just saying I never had to supervise it. So you want to be very, very careful because I, my experience was there was a pastor who um, was short staffed at, at one point, her entire branch got let go because of some fraud that had happened. And they sent her whomever, you know, was in the relief pool as tellers and what have you, have you. And she ended up with two, two um, gay guys. Now, one was very um, flamboyant. He wanted to wear the pinks and the half cut shirts and the, you know. You know. There is very, a dress policy, right? Yeah, there is a dress policy. But again, just like me, um, it was challenged every day with the, you know, the, the the guy the who worked months. with me, it was challenged every day in terms of, you know, he felt like he was always dressed appropriately and the entire bank felt like he was not dressed appropriately. And then he pulled the discrimination card on me and say, you know, I just have a problem with him because he's gay and blah, blah, blah. But I didn't have a problem with him because he was gay. I, I Like I said, the day his pants, I had sent him home that morning. I said, your pants are <coughs> too tight. You have an accident, and just as I said, I say you always throwing yourself over these desks and and um, doing all these inappropriate things. And lo and behold, by by knowing his pants had torn straight down the back, and he had to go home and change. Okay. But I have a question: With women, can't even wear no pants. That's that. see, I anyway. Okay, now I was in the I was a teller supervisor back in two thousand and one and two. You know, so this this is more than ten years ago. No, what I'm saying is female. And if you, okay, in work attire, I'm not talking to your person, in work attire, um, to, I know, and some females get sent home because their jacket or their pants are too tight. Mm -hmm. So I don't understand if she you had with this male, with the, sorry, with this, I don't, yeah. Yeah, with, with this male employee. because individual. he said- I With this was individual, thank you, Kenrick. Yeah, with his pants was not too tight, but I was discriminating against him. But let me tell you all how, what about the pastor? So her, her entire branch got let go, about six employees, because of fraud. And so she ended up with two gay guys and they were very, very good workers. Okay? okay. And she did not stop, especially the one who was flamboyant. Now that was purely discrimination in the end, both of them got fired. And it, it wasn't nothing to do with work, absolutely nothing. And so we have to, like I say, educate. Nobody should lose their job because of their sexual preference. Oriented, um, yeah. Nobody should lose their job because they are black. Nobody should lose their job because um, they are from another culture. 
Do you or, think Bahamians have a hard time with that because all the Bahamas have a hard time passing that law? Because the Bahamas is well, I know we have a hard time, but I'm saying of do you course think we that's have a because, hard time because look look how 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 we, we, we treat Asians and Jamaicans. Look how we treat them. If some of them were born here and they got citizenship at 18. So th that means that they are Bahamians now. But we that's have true. a problem. We have a problem if they get a, a supervisory position. We have a problem if they're hired. We, you know, we, we still to this day think that we are better than they are. Correct? They are just as educated and even more educated because they have two languages. And we I'm have a play, problem. I'm going to play devil's advocate. Uh, so I don't, Ms. Bullard, I don't think that that basically still exists today as it probably did 20 years ago. Okay, great. I That's think it's changed good. a little. Mm -hmm. I think it's changed a lot. Okay. I think, okay, let's put it like this. I think that a lot of persons are more open and accepting certain aspects. Mm. See, we use the, you see, that's a slippery slope. We use the nationality card, but mm. if we reference what we was previously talking about, then we start getting into the whole notion of what is nationality is set, per se, at birth. Right. Sexuality or preferences, is it by birth or is it by choice? That's, preference, that's choice, yeah. Preference, you know, that's... But it does not matter of discrimination. Well, I don't know, okay, I'd recommend some of them say they born like that. I don't know, see, it, it's a yes. funny thing. Okay, so if somebody said they so. born like that, but who are you to say they're not? Hey, like I said, I was playing devil's advocate. Okay. I was only putting it out there. Okay. <laughs> so when you become a supervisor and this binary person shows up to your um, do your job. Do your job. Remember That's the it. values and the mission statement and, and the diversity statement that you would sign on to. Remember that um, everybody should be included. It should not be that, oh, uh, this person don't look like us. They don't act like us. They're from somewhere else. And so, no, it's us against them. No, do your best. And again, all of these things that were embedded in us from you know, I, I stand to believe that our parents did us more harm than um, good. That's how I feel. There's a lot of uh, these, this racism and discrimination. Comes we from, yeah. Yeah, we were taught. And so, um, please, but, you don't work for your, against, your own. Yeah, you don't against work against black foreigners. But we, we don't mind the white ones. Just we don't, yeah, the don't like go, black foreigners. And, if you want to be honest, that's what there it is. Go. But we should be mind the white ones because the white ones are the ones that have the top position and they're getting school fees and they're getting living and they're getting trips back and forth. But why are we in matter that? That's what we should uh, yeah. be mad at. I, I think we've shifted towards that direction now. Okay, but just like you said, I think Margaret, you said, um, you know, you look in the papers, they want this year's of experience, this um, amount of language. And uh -huh. you, you, you the, Bible, really? mm -hmm. the Bible tells you that no man can be king in his own country. So go to these other countries and become expats. And then what come the Bible back. And, sorry? What no man say? can be country, a king in his own country. A prophet, is without, <laughs> a prophet is without honor in his own country. If we, we're at this particular institution, right, where they have international certifications, sooner or later, us as Bahamians, we're going to have to look at the landscape and say, do we want to stay here in the Bahamas or yeah. be just like what we used to criticize the Haitians back in the day, seeking economic empowerment in another country? That's a question that we're soon going to have to ask. Now, Kendrick, the pandemic and unemployment, 60% of the population is unemployed. Now, there's no Atlantis and no Bahama. Atlantis so, is at 17%. People are working one and two days, and then 80% of the staff are at home. Not so much. Now, we need to look at it. I had um, persons who were at Bahama, um, Dominican Republic. Um, their um, laws are a little bit more relaxed. And a couple of them went over and they work in the hotel in the DR. Okay, and they, they got very, you know, he went as, from here as supervisor, now he is director of casinos. Another went, one um, went as um, a manager of HR, now VP of HR, okay, in the DR. But they, suffered, looking good. they suffered completely through the 
pandemic, you know, getting the $200 from the government and what have you, and they just got fed up and they say, we have to start to look around. So there are opportunities out there all around the world. You know, I, it's difficult to move, but I mean, I, I, I would even do it for five years and then things settle down and then come back and make a contribution to my country. You know, but we have to think globally. If, if there are no jobs here, we can't just sit down and keep talking about, oh, you know, jobs here. Like, uh, you know, we have go to get leave. your degree or do whatever whilst you, whilst you travel. Because for some reason, the world respects expats. And you could get free living, free school free for your kids and, and what that. So, so try it. Okay. Yeah, that, a lot of that happening now. Yeah, try it. Yeah. Okay. And so then, and when we come back, we will um, end with what can a supervisor do to improve employee work balance? And again, this is a benefit, just like the meal allowance and the overtime that the um, um, institution provides. But managers and supervisors like to make you feel bad for um, taking advantage of this. You know, I was offered a flexi time. They say, oh, it's the pandemic. We can't have everybody in the office work from home. And then they ask me every single day, Miss Polly, to come in the office. Oh. <laughs> for what? You know, and then we had a group of people who were very unhappy at home because they had very little young babies and they couldn't deal with the crying and the raising children and the, the schoolwork. And so they wanted to come to work every day, even though it would exceed the number of people allowed to be at work. They need and so break those from people them. who were unhappy at home, every day they talked about the people who were home. You think them people work in? You think they're doing what they're supposed to do? They, it, it is it's ludicrous. If the co company offers a benefit, better or not, you know, everybody has a different situation. Okay? And if working from home and I am productive, and I do my work, you don't worry about where I drive in all the way out like a key every single day. I was happy not to have to waste the gas. I was happy not to have to get dressed. But the people who had to get dressed and and, and if they stayed at home had to, to you know supervise children in school and do their homework. And so they was like, oh no, 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 I can't do this virtual school, so I have to come to work. Not that they came to work because they couldn't do their work at home, but simply because at home was inconclusive and they needed an escape, okay? And that's fine if you need an escape, but just don't make everybody else feel like their situation is your situation and they are doing something wrong, okay? Every day they said to a group of um, 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 entry level persons, um, because we first started with, you know, three days in office, two days at home. And when it was time, I said, okay, you won't be in tomorrow again. Oh, you need to ask HR if you show sure you shouldn't come. Why need I ask HR every single time? Why can't we need to ask HR? HR already said three days or one, two days or why every single time you need to ask if you show sure you must come in tomorrow. You know, so we, we, we need to stop. Is it truly a benefit? There needs to be no repercussion. There needs to be no um, in the appraisal. Well, you realize when it was the pandemic and you say people could work from home, you took um, full advantage of that. Say so, no, <laughs> you did not meet expectations, right? You all, you all find those type of things happen. Yeah, happening. You know, one institution I worked at, they said, "Well, Miss Bolle, we can't believe that you go to lunch every day." I said, Why? Yeah. I, I don't know. Because it's probably a practice there that they don't go for lunch. But I mean, if you went to the lunch hour, I don't know why you not. Do something like that. Yeah, but see, like I said, I was with people who had friends at work. So they came there at 7 a.m., sat in the kitchen for two hours, then nine, talk, 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 took their lunch hour at their desk. They ate and talk, talk, talk. Right. Then at five o'clock, they shut their system down and stayed there till seven and talk some more. Right. But because I packed up and I went out the office, they said, oh, Miss Boyd, do you take your lunch every day? And I said, yeah. So am I not supposed to? You know, and it was like, it was the thing, you know? So, oh, and then the, the, you know, the people who smoke, Royal Bank offered them two 15 minute breaks. 
Oh. You take your lunch hour and your 16 minute break. You yeah, gotta smoke folks. that much that they provided the time. You know, so I, I, I don't understand. So ensure that um, employees work life balance and everybody is different. And when you have a group of people, I say mind your business. Mind your business. If this person has to pick up that you don't have no children to pick up from school, why do you care? I own the place. <laughs> you, you see what I mean? And so a lot of times that's what happens. Everybody just hateful. They they don't mind their business and they, they need flexi time and they need you, you know some extra time, but we don't they don't want to talk about that. They want to talk about Kendrick or Margaret. Why Margaret have to always take a lunch hour to three o'clock? That's a problem. Yeah. Okay, so we need to train our people to to say mind your business. Oh, mind your business. And everybody has a different need. Okay, and so therefore, as this group, as we, we come together and we represent like the account opening department or the teller lineup, we are going to mind our business and support each other. And the company offers this benefit for flexi time. So therefore, it's not your business. Okay? Yeah. Facts, that's true. Okay, okay, good. Very good. Okay, so let's go back to, to reading some of this. So, um, we could put some stories to this and we could remember. Now, it's very good on the conversation and very pleased. Everybody just kicked in in participation, so very good. So who, who is going to be our reader for tonight? Any volunteers? Or I have to, I have to pick, I have to go down this line and, and pick persons out. Okay, I go down the line. Nobody responding. And so we always hear from Kendrick, Margaret, and Blakely have written. That's red. And Denise, oh, you're, you're skipping, uh, you're moving. Where are we? I can't even see anymore. Somebody move and it throw the whole line off. Okay, but well, we gotta start over because there's only 10 of us. Okay. Let's see. No, nobody volunteer yet? No? Okay. I go in from the bottom then and then come up. Yuri? Let's let's start on page 190 at the bottom and let's read straight to understanding individual differences. On the bottom of 190. Yuri still there or Yuri go on? I am, I am, I am. Okay, okay, good. So you wanted me to read the front of the bottom of 190? Yeah, from the bottom of 190. Straight to the uh, bottom of 191. Okay. Yeah, I think everybody had a chance to read tonight, too. That's good. Tommy Sop is a hard driving, competitive person. He gives a maximum effort on everything he does at his job, on his summer softball team, and detailing his classic 1963 Corvette. In contrast, his good friend, Brad Wilson, appears to have no discipline in his life. People who know him think he's lazy. Although Brad is smart and highly capable, he has trouble holding a job because of his inability to put forth much sustained effort. Tommy summed up his appraisal of Brad. He can't stay with anything for more than half an hour or so. He gets bored and distracted easily. Supervisors like, have, like having Tommy types working for them. Some people are essentially self-motivated. You don't have much to do to get them to produce a full day's effort. The Brad Wilsons of the world are another story. Their supervisor challenge. It's a challenge to develop creative ways to motivate them. Most employees, however, aren't like either Tommy or Brad. They're more like Samantha Carr. On some activities, Samantha is, is incredibly motivated. For example, she reads two or three romance novels a week, and she gets up at 5.30 every morning and religiously runs three or four miles before showering and going to work. But as her sales draws at the local Bali fitness center, she seems bored and unmotivated. Most people like Samantha in that their levels of motivation vary across activities. What can supervisors do to increase the motivation of people like Brad Wilson and Samantha Carr? In this chapter, we provide you with some insights and tools 
that can help answer the question while exploring the exciting supervised free concept of motivation. What is motivation? First, let's describe what we mean by the term motivation. Motivation is the willingness to do something. It is conditioned by this action's ability to satisfy some need for the individual. A need in our terminology means a, psychologic, a physiological or psychological deficiency that makes certain outcomes seem attractive. An unsatisfied need an unsatisfied need creates tension, which sets off a drive to satisfy that need. The greater the tension, the greater the drive or effort required to reduce that tension. When we see employees working hard at some activity, we can conclude that they're driven by a desire to satisfy one or more needs that they value. Understanding individual differences. A common error that new supervisors often make is to assume that other people are like them. If they're ambitious, they think others will be ambitious just like them. If they place a high value on spending evenings and weekends with their family, they often assume that others feel the same way. These assumptions are frequently big mistakes. People are different. What's important to us is not necessarily important to others. Not everybody, for instance, is driven by the desire for money. Yet a lot of supervisors believe that a bonus or the opportunity for a pay increase should make every employee want to work harder. If you're going to be successful in motivating people, you have to begin by accepting and trying to understand individual differences. To make up why, let's look at personality. Most of us know people who are loud and aggressive. We know others who are quiet and passive. A number of personality characteristics have been singled out as having relevance to understanding that behavior and motivation of employees at work. Five specific personality measures have proven most powerful in explaining individual behavior in organization. Locus of control, Machiavell Machiavellism, Machiavellian, one more time. Arianism. It, one more time. <laughs> Just go yeah, on. Yeah, that go on. Well. Yeah. yeah, that word. I'm gonna get it. Mm -hmm. Self-esteem, self-monitoring, and risk was risk risk propensity. Let's look at these elements. Okay, and so we're gonna go through these um definitions because they they'll be on your midterm, of course. So again, is, is the book correct? Um, do most supervisors expect us to be just like them, or if family is important to them, um, you know, they expect family to be important to us. Is it, do you find that happening in your organization? So, uh, yes, no, maybe so. Is, is that a is that a problem? Not for me. Not for me. Oh, so you you get supervisors that respect the differences. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. That that means there's change. Like back in chapter one, remember we said that there were supervisors in the past who was the boss, who was the ruler, ruler, or you you know you do what I say. And now we have the coach, we have the trainer, we have the person with the open door policy who is you know open to suggestions. So that that's good that we are seeing some of the changes. And I want to talk about personality. And I always say this is most institutions, when they hire you, you do a personality test. In fact, if you ever applied to Atlantis, Atlantis personality test was like 200 questions. Any Anybody ever took the personality test for Atlantis? Oh. No? Oh, okay, so, sorry, yeah, two. And so you know how long it was, right? And so these, everybody has a different type of personality. And what HR managers do is, they take all the results from the personality test and then they stuff it in their drawer. And the manager never ever sees the personality, the person, or to, you know, to get an overview of who the person is. They may see the resume, the CV, what have you, but they get it. It doesn't discuss personality. And I feel that's a, like a missing step in many organizations that they don't share this personality test. So, when I was at Royal, you know, I thought I was very extensive and I, I wanted to know, like I wanted to be prepared for who was coming to work in my department. So I normally requested it. And, you know, at some point, some, you know, at one point in HR, they said, well, it's confidential. I say, really? How could it be confidential? And this, this person ain't coming to work with you. And just our HR, some parts of it, or the part that got the test was in K1. And it's like, oh, um, 
we have to put it together and send it to you. I said, okay, put it together and send it to me. Just, I, you know, this is going to help, you know, based on the, if the test is actually valid and this is a, you know, it helps you to make a decision whether or not this is the right fit for this department, then I should know, you know, so kind of if, like I say, when you become supervisors or if you're supervising now, if you are the, you know, organization carries out this test, please don't let them stuff it in the, in the drawer. Read it and, and see if it gives you some tips about who the person is. And a lot of times in, in institutions, motivation comes from within. You have to be the change that you want to see. And that's how you affect the culture of the organization. Because once people see that you change and you are speaking up and you stand, you have a, a certain standard, they, they will adopt that. Or they will leave you out. They when they come with the gossip, no, they can come in and spill it the gossip. Because I I ain't responding, you, you know, because I know how vicious the, the great grind is in organizations, and I know how it tears people down. And so you be the change, you know, that you want to see. And then these personalities, when they get out of control, you raise up above the personality and say, listen, you the you have to respect the manager of operations. You don't have to respect Ms. Pullet. The disposition, this job description, you respect that sense, meaning you don't get along, you, you, you respect the position and, and forget about the person and just raise above it. So find out the personality. And if you have to, like I said, over my 16 years in the Royal Bank, I had two supervisors that love me and two supervisors that say, Lord, you're in Miss Pullet class, you're my son drop this. Stop going to school completely, you know. So it it just depends on whether you're in the valley or whether you're on the, the rooftop or on top of the mountain. And don't ever think that for 20 years of your career, you will have people that that like you and support you and and you know 100 percent It will be at different stages in your career, just like your different stages in your life. Okay, so look for those tests. Okay, good. Thank you so much, Yuri. Tanishka. Let's talk about can personality types help predict practical work related behaviors? You first, please. Who has control over an individual's behavior? Some people believe that they control their own fate. Others see themselves as pawns of fate, believing that what happens to them in their lives is a result of luck or chance. The locus of control is the first case in inter is internal. These people believe that they control their destiny. In the second case, it is external. These people believe that their lives are controlled by outside forces. Studies tell us that employees who rate high in exter exter externity are less satisfied with their jobs, more alienated from, from the work setting, and less involved in their jobs than, than are those who rate high in internal internality for example for instance employees with an, with an external local locus of control may be less enthusiastic about their jobs because they believe that they have little personal influence on the outcome of their performing appraisals if they get a poor appraisal they are apt to blame it on their supervisors prejudice their co-workers or other events outside their control the second characteristic is called Machiavellianism. You could pronounce that word. Machiavellianism. And you could just say Mac. Mm -hmm. Machiavellianism. Named after Niccolo Machiavelli, who wrote in the 16th century on how to gain and manipulate power. An individual exhibiting strong Mac tendencies is manipulative and believes that and can't justify means. Some some might even see these people as rootless. High marks tend to be motivated on jobs that require bargaining, such as labor negotiator, or where there are substantial rewards for winning, as in commission sale. But they can get frustrated in jobs where, where specific rules must be followed, or where rewards are based more on using the proper means than on the achievement of outcomes. People differ in the degree to which they like or dislike them th themselves. The trait is called, this trait is called self-esteem. Studies confirm that people high in self-esteem 
believe that they possess more of the ability they need to succeed at work. But the most significant finding on self-esteem is that low self-esteem are more suspect, susceptible to external influence than our high self-esteem. Low self-esteem depend on positive evaluations from others. As a result, they are more likely to seek approval from others and more prone to confirm to conform to the beliefs and behavior of those they respect than a high self-esteem. Some individuals are very adaptable and can easily adjust their behavior to change changing situations. Others are rigid and inflexible. The personality trait that captures this difference is called self-monitoring. Individuals high in self-monitoring -monitor show considerable adaptability in adjusting their behavior to external situational factors. They are able adaptability in adjusting their behavior to external situational factors. They are highly sensitive to external cues and can behave differently in different situations. High self monitors are capable of presenting striking contradictions between their public personas and their private selves. Low self monitors can disguise themselves the way. They tend to display their true feelings and belief in every situation. The evidence tells us that high self monitors tend to pay closer attention to the behavior, behavior of others and are more capable of conforming than our low self monitors. Additionally, because high self monitors are flexible, they are just better than low self monitors to do, to do job situations that require individuals to play multiple roles in their work groups. People differ in their willingness to take chances. Sorry, Individuals with a high risk propensity make more rapid decisions and lose, use less information in making their choices than people with low propensity. Not surprisingly, high risk seekers tend to prefer and are more satisfied in jobs such as stock broker or putting out fire on all platforms. Go on. Yes, continue. Okay. Do you need to develop your emotional intelligence to improve your supervision skills? Becoming more attuned to your own emotions and those of others may increase your effect effectiveness on the job. Emotional intelligence consists of five dimensions that may help you cope with the daily demands and pressures of the workplace. The dimension of emotional intelligence are the following. Self-awareness, an awareness of what, how you are feeling. Self-management, the ability to manage your emotions and impulses. Self-motivation, the ability to persist in the face of setbacks and failures. Empathy, the ability to sense how others are feeling. Social skills, the ability to handle the emotions of others. Multiple studies indicate that emotional intelligence char characterizes high performers and they are better able to relate to others and individuals as well as team environments. Many humorous DOS managers indicate that emotional intelligence is essential for career success in the organization, especially in jobs requiring social interaction. How can an understanding of personality help you become a more effective supervisor? The major value of understanding personality differences probably lies in selection. You are likely to have higher performing and more satisfying employees if you match personality types with compatible jobs. In addition, there may be other benefits. By recognizing that people approach problem solving, decision making, and job interactions differently, you can better understand why, for instance, an employee is uncomfortable with making quick decisions or why an employee insists on gathering as much information as possible before addressing a problem. You can also anticipate that individuals with an external locus of control may be less satisfied with their jobs than internal, and also that they may be less willing to accept responsibility for their actions. Okay. Three theories of motivation. Thank you. Once we accept individual Mother. differences, we Tanisha. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. Um, just one question: Do you agree that um, human resource managers, what they say with about in emotional intelligence, do you agree? 
It's essential for career success in the organization. I do. Okay, why? Tell me why. What, what, what would you say about empathy? Why would empathy be important? For uh, uh, yeah. What was the question? Sorry. Yeah. Why would empathy be important? Empathy would be important because, okay, empathy is the ability to sense how others are feeling. And that is important because you have employees on the job. People come from different backgrounds. People face different problems at home. So you might have an employee who, who is always chirpy, but one day they, they may not be like that. So you have to develop the um, empathetic skills to understand why that person may feel that way. So that's where you would develop your emotional um, skills, intelligence, that's what I would say. Okay, yes, very good. So empathy is very important because a lot of times, you know, something may not be important to you, but it's important to that person. So you want to ensure that you um, display compassion. You know, you want yeah. people to come to work feeling like you actually care whether or not they have a good day or not. Okay, so that that's that's very important. Okay, good. Um, Roseanne, um, let's go to one ninety seven and let's um at the bottom let's read about what is focus on achievement. Okay, Roseanne, you there? She's saying okay. her iPhone. Well, she's yeah. yeah. I, I got a message. Thank you. Okay, Margaret, can you go to the bottom of 197 for us, please? What is a focus on achievement? Okay, 193. Eh? Oh, one, we on 197. 197. Yeah. Some people have a compelling drive to succeed, but they are striving for personal achievement rather than the rewards of success. They have a desire to do something better or more efficient than it has ever been done before. This drives the need for achievement. People of a high need for achievement, where am I? Are, what is this? In, intrinsically. Intrinsically motivated, as you will see, when high achievers are placed into jobs that stimulate their achievement drive, they are more motivated and require to their time or energy. High achievers differentiate themselves from others by their desire to do things better. They see situations where they can attain personal responsibility for finding solutions to problems. They look for rapid and ambiguous feedback on their performance so that they can tell easily whether they are improving and they set moderately changing, challenging goals. High achievers are not gamblers. They dislike succeeding by chance. They prefer the challenge of working at a problem and, and accepting the personal responsibility for success or failure. Rather than leaving the outcome to chance or the actions of others, they avoid what they perceive to be very easy or very difficult to ask. Okay, drop how, down to how important is equity? Drop, where are you dropping down to? To the bottom, where it says how important oh, is equity. Okay. Suppose your company just hired someone new to work in your department, doing the same job you're doing. That person is essentially the same age as you with almost identical educational qualifications and experience. The company is paying you $4,800 a month, which you consider very competitive. How would you feel if you found out that the company is paying the new person whose presenters are not one bit better than yours, $5,600 a month? You would be- Mind your business, mind your business. You would be very <laughs> upset and angry. <laughs> You'd probably think it wasn't fair. You're, you're not likely to think you're on the page. Oh, Lord. And you might direct your anger into actions, such as reducing your work effort. Yes, I will. Taking long <laughs> coffee breaks or taking extra days off by golden sex. Yes, I shall. Mom? Your reactions <laughs> illustrate the role that equity plays in motivation. People make comparisons of their job inputs and outputs relative to others and inequities have a strong bearing on the degree of effort that employees um, exert. Hi, Claude. Okay, equity theory states that employees receive what you can get from a job situation outcomes in relation to what they put into inputs. 
and then compare the input outcome ratio with the input outcome ratio of others. If they perceive their ratios to be equal to the relevant others with whom they compare themselves, a state of equity is said to exist. They feel that situation is fair, that justice prevails. If the ratios are unequal, inequity exists. That is, the employee tends to view themselves as under rewarded and, uh, and over, hold on. The employee tends to view themselves as under rewarded or over rewarded. When inequities occur, employees attempt to correct them. Equity theory recognizes that employees are concerned not only with the absolute, um, absolute amount of rewards they receive for their efforts, but also with the relationship of this amount to, other, to what others receive. Inputs such as effort, experience, education, and competence can be compared to outcomes such as salary levels, raises, recognition, other factors. When people perceive an imbalance in their Input outcome ratio relative to others, tension is created. This tension provides the basis for motivation as people strive for what they perceive as equity and fair. There is a substantial evidence to confirm the equity, the equity thesis. Employee motivation is influenced significantly by relative rewards as well as absolute rewards. It helps to explain why, particularly when employees perceive themselves as under rewarded, we all seem to be pretty good at rationalizing being over rewarded. They may reduce their work effort, produce lower quality work, sabotage the system, skip work days, or even resign. Okay, so how do we fix this to make sure that we don't have a- uh, um... Mind your business. <laughs> no, but no, but companies as well need to ensure that persons are, are paid equally. And in, in most, well, first of all, life ain't fair, right? But, but how you know that person doing everything? You don't know that. You know when persons are <laughs> you you basing it on their output. You know we, we all have that person in the organization who is somebody brought a sister cousin or in the church choir and so they getting you know they getting the same pay and, and and there's only a few people doing the work. So there's high, medium, and low um, employees in all the departments, right? And so. The institution needs to ensure that everybody is, if, if you are going to compensate um, the person who does not do the work, you need to ensure that you, you, comp you compensate everybody. And I learned this whilst I was a, um, I passed it on to, um, um, whilst I was a supervisor, but when I came, became a manager, I learned that money didn't motivate everybody. Okay, and so this was a way that I was able to fix this situation. And um, what I did is, you know, it was a bad year. I think the market had crashed and they said, oh, we, the first thing we just scale back on is reward and recognition. So I was like, oh my God, that's the only thing, you know, my um, group is very competitive based on who is going to be like employee of the year or who is going to get the department reward. Like everybody was, you know, motivated by that. And so um, I had a talk with them and I said, you know, the budget got cut in half this year. And so even if you become employee of the year, the, the cash award is, is way less. And I don't even know, you know, perhaps I'll, I'll go into my bonus and add something to it to even make it, you know, appealing. And so one person said, well, Ms. Bullet, I'm not really motivated by money. I, I don't care if I don't get any cash. I just I, I would be happy to be the employee of the, the quarter. And I said, really, you don't want cash? Okay. And she is like, no, I don't want cash. And I don't want those movie tickets. And I don't drink beer because I used to go get like a, a coupon to Burns House for the people who like beer. And they could get like $20 worth of beer. I used to go and get movie tickets for the people who like movies and then gas vouchers, you know? And so, and phone cards and it's like no I, I don't want there and I don't want you know I said really so what do you want and she said I I just like the recognition um I'd like my um picture Damn. up in the lobby what? Um, I want um people to see you know um whilst the people wait they're always looking around at the app and stuff like that so if they were to look around at my picture that that would motivate me I said really so you don't want the money 
And she was like, no. So I said, okay. So for our next meeting, um, I'd like to make a list of um, things that motivates you. And or would you like us? I don't want to give the people who like bear the movie tickets and the people who want the phone card or the gas card. So tell me what you like. So when you win, I will pull out your card and I will give you what you like. And you would be surprised out of 10 persons. I only got four back that said I want the money. Okay. So when that person who wanted to be in the lobby, she um, we went and we paid for her to do a photo shoot. And we put that picture up in the lobby and we gave her not one cent, not a penny. And she, she, she was, she was so happy. Like she used to walk past the picture every day. Like, and she didn't have to come to the lobby to, to get to where she needed to go, but she used to walk past and she used to say, who that is up there? That's me. That's me. And she, she loved it. And one time a customer came in and they said, oh, that's your employee of the year. And, and the receptionist said, yes. And the, the guy said, I'd like to meet her. And this, because we did dealt with high network individuals. And so very, very rich guy. And he said, congratulations. I just wanted to congratulate you. And he said, my wife is on the way. And when his wife came, he said, this is the employee of the year. She must be a, a, a very nice lady and very hardworking. And listen to me, that sent her into, a, I don't know. And she asked them to take a picture. They took a picture and she was overjoyed. Okay, so it's not always money. And you will have persons that, um, you know, are not motivated by money. And, and that's why the book tells you, don't be surprised when, when people are not like you, they like different things. And so listen, that's it. That's it. The company a whole lot of money. Sometimes they give up to $1,000 for employee of the year. You know, and then another person said only management had the covered parking, but he had a BMW and he didn't want his BMW out in the, the parking lot. And when he get in his car, it'd just be so hot. So one of the gifts I gave to him that didn't cost the bank a dollar was I said, okay, you have my parking for three months. And he thought I gave him the best thing in the world. Again, it was free. Okay, so you have to think outside the box. You have to be a little creative. Everybody's not the same. Everybody is motivated by something different. Sometimes people will make more money, but you can you find out what they like. And one thing I hate too is that people give me, you know, things that I don't like. Like I'm allergic to perfume. So what I get for every birthday, every Christmas, perfume, right? So, so just ask that question. So there, there, there are things that supervisors and companies can do that don't cost. Or you could say, well, I'm very, um, you know, this person, I don't know how you know their salary, but they make this because of A, B, or C. And so nobody feels unfair. Nobody, like Marvin, don't call up this attitude and say, you have a more coffee break. So you, um, you know, call in and say, would Marvin, would that appease you or, or not really? Hmm. <laughs> well, what you you about, don't resonate with you because you're motivated by money. Yeah, I'm motivated by money. Yeah, yeah. Me too. I'm sorry. I'm motivated by yeah, money. I, want, I don't want that parking spot and thing. That sounds good, but uh, no. You got a half car in order to have parking spot. <laughs> right, I have I a car. Don't take pictures, so don't put my picture nowhere. Yeah, and I don't want nobody is... calling me out of reduce employee. Yeah, so no, if... give me give me the nice bonus and all that stuff, the picture, trophy. Um, yeah, no. no. I'm okay, motivated good. by two things: money and like, like output, like efficiency. Actually, so like the money and how efficient I can do my job. That's what I'm motivated by. Right. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. Okay, but make sure that your employees <laughs> do not feel that, you know, um, their ratio is less than others who are producing less. If they know the salary, which they shouldn't. But, I know, so they should, they should, should be confidential. Yeah, it's supposed to be, but you know, people just have their way. Nothing is confidential in this country. Nothing, nothing, right, you're right. You're right. <laughs> okay, Margaret, continue to read for us. Do employees really get what they expect? 
The final perspective we present is an integrative approach to motivation. It focuses on it focuses on expectations, specifically expect, expectancy theory argues that individuals analyze three relationships, effort performance, performance rewards, and rewards personal goals. The level of effort depends on the strengths of the expectations that, there, that these relationships can be achieved. According to expectancy theory, an employer will be motivated to ex exert a high level of effort when he or she believes that effort will lead to a good performance appraisal. Mm -hmm. That is a good <laughs> appraisal. It will lead to organizational rewards, such as a bonus, exactly, a salary increase or a promotion, and that the rewards will satisfy the employee's personal goals. The theory is illustrated um, in Exhibit 8-6. Expectancy theory has provided a powerful explanation of employee motivation. It helps, it helps explain why a lot of workers aren't motivated in their jobs and merely do the minimum necessary to get by. This can be made clearer if we look at the theory's three relationships in a little more detail. We present them as questions that employees need to answer affirmatively. First, if I give a minimum effort, will it be recognized in my performance evaluation? For a lot of employees, the answer is no. Why? Their skill level may be deficient, which means that no matter how hard they try, they're not, li they're not likely to be a high performer. The company's performance appraisal system may be uh, poorly designed. Oh, Lord. Assessing trait story, for example, rather than behaviors making it difficult or impossible for an employee to achieve a high evaluation. Still another possibility is that employees, right or wrong, perceive that their supervisors don't like them. As a result, they expect to get a poor appraisal regardless of their level of performance. These examples suggest that one possible source of low employee motivation is the belief of an employee that no matter how hard he or she works, the likelihood of getting a good performance appraisal is low. Second, if I get a good performance appraisal, would it lead to an organizational reward? Man, many employees set the performance rewards relationship in their job as weak. The reason is that organization rewards a lot of employees besides just performance. For example, when pay is allocated to employees based on factors such as seniority, being cooperative, or, not, or kissing up to the boss, <laughs> employees are likely to see the performance rewards relationship as being weak and demotivating. Last, if, I, if, I'm a, if I'm rewarded, do I, do I find the rewards personally attractive? The employee works hard in hope of getting a promotion, but, pays a, a pay, but gets a pay raise instead, or the employee wants a more interesting and challenging job. Um, one second, please, I have to answer my door, one second. And you want to check to see if love change? Oh, Lord, you put my stuff on. No, we can tell you. Please, yeah, I guess he. I can start from second again. No, love. Lastly, if I'm rewarded, do I reward? Right, do last, I find if I'm attractive. Okay, last, if I'm rewarded, do I find a reward personally attractive? The employee works hard in hope of getting a promotion, but gets a pay raise instead. Or the employee wants a more interesting and challenging job, but receives only a few words of praise. Unfortunately, many supervisors are limited in the rewards that they can distribute. This makes it difficult to tailor rewards to individual employees. Still, other supervisors incorrectly assume that all employees want the same thing, thus overlooking the motivational effects of differentiating rewards. In either case, employee motivation is not fully maximized. Okay, so you, you agree with that, that the supervisors assume everybody wants the same thing with money, like I, I assume, and um, would you be if even though you were motivated by money and I say, well, okay, the budget is 
show sure, but I do have these movie tickets. Would you still appreciate the recognition? Personally, I would. Okay, Personally, even if you don't get the exact thing that you, you would have listed. Right, but just, just the fact that my supervisor actually sees and appreciates what I did, and it took pride of what took pride of what I actually performed, I would actually feel good about myself that that somebody noticed what I did and I actually didn't work in vain. Because I, I think everybody wants some kind of recognition someday. Correct. And then there's no not always money to give or to spend. Okay. So right. just be appreciate you know being appreciative that you were recognized. So sometimes it depends, you know, the, uh, some organizations always cry there's no money. And, you know, sometimes they make an extra effort, but saying thank you or recognizing somebody is free. Mm -hmm. So don't always look at the budget. And like I say, sometimes you can be innovative. And, and, and to some people that recognition is enough. Um, what about the second one where it says kissing up to the boss um, um, can be the motivating. Um, do we have that in our institutions where, you know, it's the favorite or this person who is the, the the teacher's pet or, you know, do we, do, do we still have that or for the most part supervisors try to be neutral? Um, my, mind you, it, I don't think that happens now, but naturally you can't, you can't, um, you can't dismiss if some if supervisors and some employees have the same mindset. So when, when a supervisor and some employees or a small percentage of employees have the same mindset, they automatically attract each other and they will usually socialize more. So that's just that's just the employee, that's just a, that's just a workplace culture. Okay, correct. Okay, good. Thank you so much and thank you, um, you um, for filling in. Denise, Denise, how can we create an atmosphere in which employees really want to work? And again, I know I it said in the last class, counseling um, will more than likely be the essay question, but also this is a good um, possibility for the, for the essay question. And like I said, we have a test bank where we pull the question. So this is also a possibility. So we want to pay close attention to this. Denise, are you there? Yes, ma'am. I'm here. Okay. So tell um, us. Boy, that's kind of tricky. Uh, there's different things that you can do. Like you said, you have to know your employees personally because, I mean, yeah, because everybody is not motivated by money. I, I don't know how that has worked, but. Um, okay, so you, you have to learn. You read on the bottom of page 200, how, how do we create that? Let's see, let's see if we get some ideas. Well, the paragraph, how do we, okay, how do we create an atmosphere in which employers really want to learn? We presented a number of approaches to motivating in this chapter. If you are a supervisor concerned with motivating your employees, how do you apply the various concepts introduced? Although there is no simple, all-encompassing set of guidelines, the essence of what we know about motivating, motivating employees is distilled in the following suggestion. Recognize individual differences. If we learn one thing over the years, it's that employees are not the same. People have different needs. Whereas you may be driven by the need for recognition, I may be far more concerned with satisfying my desire for security. We know that a mentor, a minor, minority of employees have a high need for achievement. But if one or more of the people working for you are high achievers, make sure you design their jobs to provide them with the personal responsibility, feedback, and intermediate dis degree of risk that is most likely to provide them with motivation. Your job as a supervisor includes learning to recognize the dominant need for each of your employees. Match people to jobs. There is, a, there is abundant evidence to support the idea that motivational benefits occur from carefully matching people to jobs. 
Some people prefer routine work with repetitive tasks, whereas many people enjoy being part of a team. Others do their best to work they are isolated when they are isolated from other people and are able to do their, their jobs independently. When jobs differ in terms of autonomy, the variety of tasks to be done, the range of skills they, de they demand and they like, you should try to match employees to jobs that best fit their capabilities and personal preferences. Set challenges, challenging goals. We talk about the importance of goals in chapter three. In that discussion, we should we, we showed that challenging goals can be a source of motivation. When people accept and are committed to, to a set of specific and different difficult goals, they will work hard to achieve them. Although we haven't directly addressed goals as motivators in this chapter, our earlier review of the evidence clearly indicate the power of goal in influencing employees' behavior. Based on the er that earlier evidence, we suggest that you sit down with each of your employees and, uh, and jointly set tangible, verif verifiable, and measurable goals for a specific time period. Then create a mechanism by which these employees will receive ongoing feedback as to their progress towards achieving these goals. If done properly, these goal setting process should act to motivate employees. Encouraging participation. Allowing employees to participate in decisions that affect them have been shown to increase their motivation. Participation is empowering. It allows people to take ownership of decisions. Examples of decisions in which employees might participate include setting work goals, choosing their own benefit packages, and selecting preferred work schedule and assignments. Participation, of course, should be at the option of the employee. No one should feel compelled to participate in this decision making. While participation is associated with increasing employee commitment and motivation, consistent with our earlier discussion of individual differences, some people may prefer to waive their rights to participate in discussion that affects them. These preferences should be heeded. Individualizing re rewards. Because employees have different needs, what acts as a reinforcer for, reinforcer for one may not work for another. You should use your knowledge of individual differences to individualize the rewards over which you have control. Some of the more obvious rewards that supervisors allocate include pay, job assignment, work hours, and the opportunity to participate in goal setting and decision making. Okay, thank you so much, um, Denise Blakely. Can you continue? Link rewards to performance. Miss Bullet, I don't have my book. I'm sorry. Okay, Kendra. Okay. Links rewards to performance. In both reinforcement theories and expectancy theories, motivation is maximized when supervisors make rewards contingent on performance. Rewarding factors other than performance only acts to reinforce and encourage those other factors. Key rewards such as pay increases and promotions should be allocated for the attainment of the employee's specific goals. To maximize the importance of the reward contingency, sorry. Supervisors should look for ways to increase the visibility of rewards. Publicizing performance bonuses and allocating annual salary increase in a lump sum rather than spreading them, spreading them out over an entire year are examples of actions that will make rewards more visible and potentially more motivating. Check for equity. Rewards or outcomes, or outcomes 
should be perceived by employees as equaling the input they give. At a specific level, this should mean that experience, abilities, efforts, and other obvious inputs should explain differences in pay, responsibility, and other obvious outcomes. The problems, however, is complica complicated by the fact that there are dozens of inputs and, and outputs, and that employee groups place different degrees of importance on them. This suggests that one person's equity is another person's inequity. So an, an ideal reward system should probably weigh inputs different, differently to arrive at the proper reward for each job. Don't ignore money. Our last suggestion may seem incredibly obvious, but it's easy to get so caught up in setting goals or providing opportunities for participation that you forget that money is the major reason most people work. The allocation of performance-based wages increased. Piecework bonuses and other pay incentives is important in determining an employee motivation. Maybe the best case for not to overlook money as a motivator is a review of 80 studies evaluating motivational methods and their impacts on employees' productivity. Goal setting alone produced on average a 16% increase in productivity. Effort, efforts to reduce jobs to make them more inter, interesting and challenging yielded 8 to 16% increases. And employees' participation in decision making produced a median increase of less than 1%. In contrast, in contrast, monetary incentives led to an average increase of 30%. Okay, so that just means that most people are like me and Denise and me motivated Show the money. by the money. <laughs> right. Show the money. No one else falls, the money will work. Okay, good. 2207, what can um, supervisors do to improve employee work-life balance? A number of scheduling op options have been introduced to give both the supervisor and the employee more flexibility and improve employee work-life balance. In addition to an increase in increased use of temporary and contingent workers. Contemporary companies are looking at other options such as flex time and job sharing. Flex time, short for flex work time, is a scheduling option that allows employees within the specific parameters to decide when to go to work. Employees have to work a specific number of hours a week but they, fee, but they are free to vary the hours of work within certain limits. Each day consists of a common core, usually six hours, with a flexibility, a flexibility band surrounding the core. For example, exclusive, exclusive of one hour lunch break, the core may be 9 a.m. to 3 p.m with the office actually opening at 6 a.m. and closing at 6 p.m. All employees are required to be at their jobs during the common core period, but they are allowed to schedule their other two hours before or after the core time. Some flex time programs allow extra hours to be accumulated and turn into a free day off each month. Flex time has become a popular scheduling option, especially among professional employees and Gen Xers. For, in, for instance, a study of firms' practices to enhance the work-life balance found that about 60% 60 offered employees some 
form of flex time. The potential benefit of flex times are numerous for both the employee and the employer. They include improve employee motivation and morale, reduce absenteeism. As a result, enabling employees to be better balanced work uh, and family responsibilities, increase wages as a result of productivity gains and the ability of the organization to recruit higher quality and more diverse employees. Flex times major drawback, however, is that it is not applicable to every job. It works well with job tasks for which an employee interaction with people outside his or her department is limited. It is not a viable option when key people must be available during standard hours. When workflows requires tightly determined scheduling, or when specialists are called on to maintain coverage of all the functions in a unit. Job sharing is a special type of part-time work. It allows two or more individuals to split a traditional 40-hour week job. One person might perform the job from 8 a.m. to noon, while the other performs the same job at 1 p.m. to 5 p.m., or both could work full but alternating days alter, alternate days job sharing which is growing in popularity allows organizations to draw on talents of more than one individual for a given job it provides the opportunity to acquire skilled workers for instance single parents with young children and retirees who might not be available on a full-time basis the major drawback from a supervisor's perspective is finding compatible pairs of employees who can successfully coordinate the intricacies of one job. Okay, good. Thank you for that, Kendrick. Um, so have you had this experience with FlexiTime um, on your job? Are they making it available to the staff or what's your experience? Uh, we use uh, FlexiTime um, where multiple collectors came in at different particular, uh, different hours. Because what we found that was successful is that the person who would traditionally get the later shift, that we were able to catch up with people who were avoiding us. Because they would, anytime the clock at five, they say, you know, what he called on us this late. But what we found is that 6, say, 6 p.m., 7 p.m., we would find we'd normally catch those persons. That is something that they employed in the past. It's not something currently that we're doing right now. Okay, but you did find it beneficial. Oh, it was definitely beneficial, beneficial. yeah. And no, nobody made you feel like you were doing something wrong, even though it was mm -mm. a benefit that they offered. Mm -mm. Right. It was, something, it was just effective, right. in my and opinion. All, all over Canada, um, you find that the mothers, they normally work until 3 p.m. so they can collect the children from school and and um, some sign on at home, you know? And so there, it, it's a lot of times when we have like the Canadians come down there, they ask, what, what do the mothers do? Why are they here after three? Who's collecting their kids, you know, from school? And so, you know, it was a big concern um, why they weren't on, on flexi time. But of course, you know, the some, especially the people who would have been um, in the institution for years, um, these people just want slack off. They want extra time. How they could expect to pick up their children from school. So, you know, as we educate ourselves, hopefully the culture will, um, you know, change and, and we'll be supportive, more supportive of each other. Um, another thing the book talked about is absenteeism. Um, have you ever heard that presenteeism causes, costs more money than absenteeism? I've never heard it, but I, I get it. Okay, so of course, um, if somebody calls in um, sick, they don't show up to work, absenteeism. Presenteeism is when they are actually sick and they come to work. And there are millions of studies all over and somebody even, um, you know, did they, it was in the Nassau Guardian or the Tribune um, a few years ago where they said, you know, it's very applicable to the Bahamas. Um, they find that people 
are so afraid to call in, you know, sick, they come to work um, and they're non productive the whole day. Or, like the book talked about, um, when the lady's son, I think it was in chapter nine, somebody's son had gotten locked up. And so she was up all night, but she yeah. was too afraid to call into work. And so she showed up. And so, what essentially happens is the person is so overwhelmed that they, you know, they show up to work, but they do not perform. So it's best that they, you know, stay at home. And so many companies, um, you know, realize that this, again, too, was systemic where there was presenteeism, but people that were not performing. And so I think now most companies have not only do your vacation, but there's a, a family responsibility TV that you could call um, out and you could say, well, hey, something happened. Um, I was overwhelmed by and, and I can't make it in and I, this is not vacation and this is not, I'm calling out sick because I'm not sick, but it's family responsibility leave. Do, do, has that been implemented into your organization, Kendra? Um, I can't speak to it. I know an organization that I used to work for had something like that, but okay. I can't speak to currently right now. It may be there as well as it may not. All right, and on 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 the those um days as well, they use you know if you need to go and license your car, that takes half a day because you have to do your driver's license or any other you know um responsibility, and and it, you know it has worked for a lot of persons. Or I know um another institution that says you know the people who have the pickup, they work from nine to twelve, and then we work till from one to six, and and so. There are a lot of, of um, different ways to, to make it work, but you have to always remember that you work with human beings and you want to have them as productive as possible. And so if they don't have to worry about what's happening at home, they are comfortable, we created a, an environment where they are comfortable and they are happy at work, you know, pro productivity will increase, loyalty will increase, and you will see that all those goals and um, you know, goals that you would have set or, or targets, um, they, they endorse and they work very hard to try and achieve it, okay? So think about all of that. And like I said, that, that's also a possibility of um, the essay question, what do we do? And we don't want to write, a, you know, fluff. We want to take some uh, parts from the book and then do some research as well to say, you know, um, why this may be effective, okay? Okay, any questions or concerns? No, no, I'm fine. Okay, so excellent. Um, thank you all. Um, the participation level was 100% better than it, it normally is. And again, like I said, you have to read the book and then you come and, you know, discuss it. Um, any questions? Um, like I said, the book is, is, is pretty good. I don't, I don't know. Do you feel that the book is pretty good or is just Ms. Boyd put in that way? Have you found it an, as an easy read when you did read it, Kendra? I find that it's just, okay, like how you're just being personally, some of the aspects you're familiar with, but some you're not completely comfortable with because they're brand new. I find that that is a challenging aspect. Even when coming into some of the uh, definitions, you're trying to memorize them exactly. And I find that that is, you know, the difficulty in that and be an overwhelming amount of information. I don't think you're gonna get this in a 12, 14 week setting, but you know, you're growing. So I guess you learn with it, you're just growing. And so what I would do, I try my best to, you know, streamline it. And what I try to do is, um, you know, give an example. So most of the time you may not remember the exact thing that the book says, but you can remember an example or, you know, when we talk about, absenteeism versus presenteeism or you, you remember when we talk about rewards the story that I told about you know it does not always have to be money so I hopefully all of that will help yes ma'am okay. okay good any other questions or concerns no so the reading okay. isn't bad it's just you know it's just a lot Okay, it's just a lot. Okay. Yeah, but I don't think it's it. Okay, so we'll try to scale it down as um, um, much as possible and, and so it could be retainable. But we, we'll cover most of what's in the exam in the review. And so it's, it's definitely achievable. What, what the 
outcome of all of this is, is that you go, you're receptive to it and you go into your organizations and you display the right, you know, behaviors and the right attitude and, and, and you be kind and you, you treat people right and, and you make them comfortable and we want to, you know, do away with the corporate Bahamas where people hate coming to work because we are the toxic people that make it, you know, very unpleasant. So, um, in the end, that we want to ensure that we, you know, supervise properly. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, excellent. So remember, please put on all the bells and whistles for Miss Bullard when you do your presentation. Everybody's camera is going to be on next week, and we are going to present. And remember to please send your essay um that Sunday so I can confirm. That you have it. I, I think Yuri and Tanisha so far want, or is it Margaret that need to be do it on the 16th? Yuri, Mar is it you? Um, or you be ready? Um, Yuri. I, I, I should be ready. Okay, so Margaret? Yes, ma'am. It will just be Antonisha on the 16th? Ma'am. Um, okay, so I do still expect your um, project to be uh, you know submitted on the Sunday. Yes, ma'am. Okay. okay. Okay, so that's Margaret and Tanisha on. So everybody except Margaret and Tanisha's project, I should receive on the 7th. Margaret and Tanisha, I should receive it on the 14th. Okay? Okay. Pardon? When you say, when, when should you receive my work? Because, because okay. you're presenting on the 16th, you can say, or it's just that you need a different um, presenting day, not that you need extra time, like Tanisha. I'll tell on the 14th. Yeah, so Margaret and Tanisha on the 14th, everybody else on the 7th. Remember, if you don't send it in, you get an incomplete for this as well as your, um, um, you cannot pass the class without it, okay? So please make sure that, you know, everybody comes prepared. Okay. Okay? Right. Okay. Yes, sir. Good night, all. Any, any more questions or concerns? Okay, excellent. Okay, so y'all have a fabulous week and we'll do this again next week, Tuesday. Okay. Okay. Good night, all. Good, Good night. night. Good night. Good night.